John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am there, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said his, uh, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and says, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world, and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man shall be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Let's pray together. Father, we yield to you now. We, We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's supernatural, Lord. We know that we don't ultimately inspect your word. Your word inspects us by your Holy Spirit. So we yield now to you. We pray that you would use these verses to make us into disciples in an increasing way. And we yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the last week of Jesus' public ministry. The Apostle John is almost at chapter 13, and, and beginning in chapter 13, we see, the, you know, basically we start at the, the night of his betrayal there, and, and uh, all that happens there. We're going to slow down a lot when we get into these verses, especially chapters 14 through 16, when he talks about the Helper, the Holy Spirit. There's so much that he's pouring into. Remember, the Synoptic Gospels were written 30 to 40 years prior to this. John's in his late 80s, early 90s here. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been out since the, for a long time, decades. So as he's taking all these things to, to prayer, John, I'm sure he asked the Lord, what do you want me to write? And, and also he has the vantage point of looking back and seeing what would be helpful, what, would be, what was left out that would be helpful. There's so much that he covers that, that none of the other Gospels cover. And I just love how the Holy Spirit worked. It would be, again, it would be like, I've said this before, but it'd be like if, you know, the, the three Gospels came out in the 70s or 80s, you know, the 80s or 70s, somewhere back in there. And then all of a sudden today, the next Gospel came out. That's how long the distance is. It's hard to think that it's it been that long, but He's going to, he includes all these things, and then today we're going to see something that's very interesting, and you have to really look at it <clears throat> and, and see the whole thing to be able to understand what, what the Holy Spirit is revealing here. And what he's revealing is that Jesus explains glorification. He explains glorification. He explains how all that works. Also, he's expressing his anguish, all these things. And so we're going to look at that and see how the Holy Spirit wants to help us understand these things for our own lives. So uh, what's interesting is then we begin in verses 20 and 21, the Gentiles want to meet with Jesus. Look at verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was 
from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So who are these Greeks? They're not Hellenistic Jews. Uh, you know, what I mean Hellenistic, meaning that they're not Grecian Jews. In Acts, the beginning of Acts, the Hellenistic widows were being neglected in the daily distribution as they were trying to help the widows, like we all should. And he's, he's uh, you know, trying to help at that time. The, the, the leadership, is, I should say, is trying to help these people be ministered to, these, these, these uh, Jews that were, had this Greek background. Uh, but these, so these aren't Hellenistic Jews. These are God fearers. Israel, God always laid it out for. He's again. He's always trying to draw people to Himself. He's going to get to that as He talks about how He's going to die and everything. But there's there was if a person that was a Gentile wasn't a Jew wanted to draw close to God, then they have the court of the Gentiles. They had the court around the temple complex to go and pray and seek God. And we've covered how it ruined it for them that these money changers and these people selling things and ripping people off were in their area there and they got the, the truth misrepresented. So these are Gentiles and God fear, the formal, the formal um, way of saying it back then was the, they were proselytes of the gate, meaning that they were outside the, sit, the city walls, you know, and they were seeking God. Those were God fears, but they're also what we call proselytes and they would consider proselytes. They would call them proselytes of righteousness. And these were people that weren't Jews, but they, they submitted themselves to the priest. They got circumcised. I mean, of course, they celebrated the festivals like these god fearers do, but it was a deeper level of commitment. Cornelius in the book of Acts was a god he, he, As a Roman centurion, he wouldn't be able to commit to the feast. He wouldn't be able to do that. And so likely he wasn't, he wasn't a proselyte. He was a god fearer So that's what these people, who these people are. And they came to Philip, which is possibly because Philip is not a, Philip is a Gentile name. And, and so he, you know, we're, we're, we see this there that they come to him. And, and, and I love how John includes that Philip was from Galilee. Why, why would he include that? We already knew that. He would include that, I think, because he's showing us that these Gentiles uh, were coming from that area, potentially. So they are saying to him, to Philip, we want to see Jesus. And it's in the surface, you can look at it and go, they just want a glimpse of him. Let me just see this Messiah. And that, I'm sure, could have been for, for some of them. I don't know. But they're, it's more of like when you go to a, you know, a, a doctor's appointment and you come and say, I came to see Dr. So-and-so. You know, that it's a point, and they're wanting a meeting with him. So they come to Philip, and then Philip, we're told in verse 22, came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So there's nothing great about that, I mean, or significant, I don't believe. Philip is just communicating that to him, and then they bring it to Jesus. So uh, the them, in verse 23, so we see, but Jesus answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified so i don't know if the them includes these gentiles i think they do because it talks about the end of our verses that there were people there and they're not told the disciples so i think it's likely that they heard all of this but he could have been just saying it to the people that were around him that that weren't these gentiles including his disciples so we don't know we don't want to speak where the scripture is silent I'm very conservative that way. It's like just, if, you know, if you want us to know, you would have spelled it out. We can have theories and all of that, but, uh, you know, it's important for us to see that, that um, you know, he's speaking, he's answering this whole topic, and he says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's the first sense that, we, that Jesus is talking about glorification. Uh, and, and, and I think that's important because, uh, you know, Obviously, he's about to be glorified in the sense of after all this, all this occurs, all the death and resurrection, he's getting prepared for all that. But the hour has come. The hour has come. His death, burial, and resurrection, they are imminent. And, and this is why he came into the world. He says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. We've seen as we've gone through John, verse by verse, we've seen him say, my hour has not yet come. And he's... And he's, he's delaying this. He knows there's a specific time. Last Sunday, you can go on our YouTube channel and watch that, but I got into the whole thing about Palm Sunday and how God fulfilled scripture 
to the day that, that, that Messiah would, would arrive and um, ultimately be cut off. And so that's why Jesus said to the Pharisees when they said, tell these people to be quiet. He says, if, if they don't say anything, the rocks are going to cry out because this is going to be fulfilled. So this is why he, you know, this is why he came into the world. But notice at the end of verse 23, he speaks of um, the son of man. He says the son of man, and that's a messianic reference. And Daniel, you know, I don't know if these people read Daniel because they're going to react to this later, but uh, he's, they don't understand that terminology, these, these people. So uh, we're verse 24, uh, Jesus is going to provide an illustration because he's talking about glorification. So he's going to provide uh, this whole illustration for them to understand. He's also preparing the disciples for his departure. They're going to ask why. Why did this have to happen? Again, they were expecting a political Messiah. They're expecting that Messiah, and they're going to ask why. Why would this happen? And he's telling them ahead of time, uh, giving them an illustration that they would understand. This is an agrarian society. This is all about farming. Even today, it's so much farming in, in Israel. And so he's going to help them understand what he's about to do, and then he's going to connect it with us, which is amazing. Verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a, a grain of wheat f falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Notice the word much there. produces much grain. So when, you know, when, when um, a, a grain of wheat is planted, it produces grain by a multiple. There's, that's, that's kind of like the law of how God sets up planting something. When you sow something, it, you usually get more than what you planted. And, and that's just kind of how things are. Apple trees, you plant an apple seed, you get how much fruit do you get from one tree? Over and over and over again. There's a multiplication. I believe that all of how God created this whole system of planting seeds and growing crops and all that was to illustrate Jesus' death and, and, and resurrection and how he would be glorified and, and, and those specific things. So uh, he's, he's going to tie that to his death, burial, and resurrection. And, and so that's what Jesus did. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. How many lives did that affect? Billions. He allowed, allowed mankind to be able to know God through that because there's a problem. We are, our problem is a sin problem. I don't know if you notice that. But we're separated from God. We're born separated from God. And then we, there's a point in time when God reveals through somebody who loves us enough to tell us the truth, the gospel, the good news that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again the third day. And salvation isn't by works, it's, by, it's a free gift. And he accomplished all of that. So talk about the multiplication so he's helping them see ahead of time. You know this illustration. You know everything about how this works, what's about to happen. I'm going to go into the grave, and I'm going to ra rise, and then I'm going to be glorified, and the result of that is going to cost, is going to influence billions and billions of people. But he didn't stop there. Look with me at verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So this is the wheat falling in the ground for us. This is the way that we produce fruit. This is the way we know God. This is the way that we are, are, are used by God. We're an extension of him in this world. We affect others. So we, we die. We know we're, Paul talks about it in Romans, about dying with Christ and wrecking our body dead and all of that. And, and, and it's so clear here. So he's saying to them, this is how something, because part of glorification is the multiplication. Part, part of how God esteems something as glorified. In a sense, the wheat is glorified by the crop that it produces. And it's the same way. Jesus is going to die on the, on the cross. He's going to be buried. He's going to resurrect. And because of that, now we get the privilege of being able to be glorified as, as time goes by, as we, as we are saved, as we receive Christ, and then he's going to give us a glorified body. But we get in the meantime, between that time and the time that we're glorified, we get to multiply. We, do, we get to bear fruit. We get to preach the gospel. We get to be salt and light. We get to care about somebody other than ourselves, get our eyes off ourselves and onto others and be salt and light and be an extension of him in this world. So he offers that uh, as a possibility. We're told in Luke chapter 9, 
Verse 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. We're also told in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Not a popular message today. Even churches, even. So often the churches are not talking about dying to self. And one of the signs of the last days, it says, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, they'll be lovers of themselves. That's one of the signs. It's increasingly loving themselves, increasing, you know, valuing their life, living a life apart from Christ. And he calls us to something deeper. Who wouldn't? expect God to just, I mean, if you're thinking, seeing how he works and how he is, he, what a privilege it is. So again, the, the, what he's aiming at are not fans. There's so many fans of Jesus. There's so many people that want to be around the things of God. They want the blessings of God, but yet they don't want to die to self. They don't want to be a disciple. They don't want to die to their agenda. Every day we have to settle that. Every day when we wake up, we have to settle the lordship issue. And take up our cross for that day. Die to self. Self is the problem. We can point to everything else. The world wants to blame shift. The world, we, our flesh wants to blame shift. Wants to always blame somebody else. Never wants to take personal responsibility. Jesus said that f- to, to follow him. But to follow him, you have to die to you. You have to not follow yourself. I mean, that'd be kind of hard. You'd kind of go in circles maybe if you got off balance. Uh, but you know, just doing, you know, doing what, what you want to do is the antithesis of what God wants you to do, unless he puts things on your heart and leads you. Now, we have desires of our hearts, of course, all those things. I'm not minimizing those things. As we yield to him, though, the desires of our heart become what his desire is. We start having the priorities that he wants for us. We start having the things that, that are doing the things that he says are important to him, and we care about that. And, and so it's such, a, it's such a hard thing. It's the death of ourselves. We hate it. Every day, die to self and choose that, uh, choose yes. I mean, choose him, choose what his plan is. So we see here that the only um, way that we can experience abundant life in this life is yield, being yielded to him and surrendered to him. We think that we're gonna, he's going to ruin our fun, that, or we think that you know, some of our great plan that we have or something is going to be better if we you know, like, kind of do a workaround. That's a really popular term in our culture today, workarounds. There's no workaround for discipleship. We have to die, take up our cross daily, and, and follow him. I'm not saying it's easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. We just have to yield to him. So it's not a popular message, but this is kind of what he's getting at related to um, being, being glorified. As, I mean, be, you know, having our lives be what he calls it, calls it to be. So he, he says there in verse 25, or 26 rather, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there, um, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So that, that's a beautiful promise to us. Because when we die to self and we say yes to him for that day, then we're, we're, we're yielded to what he wants. We're yielded to what he wants for that day. We're serving him. You think that serving is just here on Sundays or during a ministry during the week, but serving him is whatever he says for us to do that day. He modeled that by, by waiting for the Father's instructions. And he'd be in prayer all night sometimes. And not that he needed to, to crucify his flesh or anything like that, but he's communing with the Father, hearing from him. So... Uh, that's required. And he says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me because that's how it works. That's, that's, we get his, our instructions from him every single day. And it's not going to make some sense to some people. Of course, it's not going to go against scripture. Of course, he's not going to contradict that, but it's not going to make sense to everybody in your life, what he tells you to do. And, and so it, it's all about others. It's all about surrender to him and notice the promise and where I am there, my servant will be also. And this can be seen as like in our lives, you know, in terms of he's, we're, we're where, we're, as we go where he leads, then he is, he is ex- there, we're following him and we're with him in that sense. But it's also talking about once we're glorified, you know, we go to be with him, we get our new bodies and all of that. 
So it's a, it's a beautiful um, expression of his mercy to allow us to live a different kind of life. But he says the Father will follow, or honor us rather. So God will honor us. It's so great to be honored by God, to have him, his blessings, his favor on our lives. What a, what a, a privilege that is. So in our text, all three are glorified in a sense by dying and multiplying fruit. So the Lord Jesus talks about him being glorified. He already saw it as already seeing the end result of all of this. He gives the illustration of you want to understand what that means, then you understand a grain of wheat that goes into the ground and then it, it, it bears fruit and it multiplies. And, and so too, we is called us to die to self and to uh, yield to him every day and then let him, his power and his influence, all those things happen through our lives. It's a beautiful um, it's a beautiful thing what he does. It's a beautiful thing that he allows us to be a part of what he's doing. He doesn't need us. It's so easy to forget that. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. He wants us to participate in what he's doing. He wants us to be busy about the Father's business. The thing is, though, we allow the, the you know, as the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 12, we allow the weights and the sin that so easily ensnares us get in the way. And weights are things that are that he says for us are not for us, I believe. Christian liberties, whatever it is, other people can do it. He's specifically saying for your particular calling, where I have you right now, you have to, this is a weight, you need to let it go. And, and, and all, all, the Holy Spirit's so faithful to show us those things. I can't show you what your weights are. You can't show me what my weights are. God, the Spirit, has to show us. And then he says the sin. So God deals with us with that, and we have to... The only way to live a, 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 a life that's pleasing to God is to commune with him. And that has to happen every single day. That's why he died, so that he would, we'd be able to know him and have a personal relationship with him. What a privilege that is. So the death is required. So he says that that happens. What needs to happen regarding glorification is a death needs to happen. And he's given this physical example for them. And notice his humanity in verse 27 and, and what he is going through. He says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. The whole purpose of why he came was to go through what he had to go through. There was no other way. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked the Father, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. And there was silence. That was his portion. Two of the previous disciples said, yeah, we, we can do this cup that you're talking about. He's like, no, you can't. But they would have their own cup. You know, each of us have our own cup of what we have to go through, what we have to experience, all of those things as we go through life. And it's getting worse and worse. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse uh, before we are taken out of here. So... He says here, I want you to know what the word troubled means in verse 27, the original language. Um, it means agitation. It means anxiety. It means extreme dread. And he says, my, the, all of that is my happening in my soul. And, and, but he goes, what am I going to say? See, because he's calling them to die to self. He's calling them to die to their will. And so, of course, he's connecting it back to him. What am I going to say? I'm your example. You know, what am I going to say? I can't do this? What am I going to say? Even though my, tro my soul is troubled, it's full, it's anxiety, it has agitation, it's extreme dread, all of that. He knows he's a man, he's a man too. He has, he has a nervous system. He, has, he feels pain. God could have, you know, came in, 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 Jesus could have came and not had a, when he took on his human body, not had any nerve endings and didn't feel pain at all. He didn't do that. He chose to, that's part of what we that's part of what had to happen, him to feel that pain and all of that to go through everything to take our place, to take the punishment that we deserved. And it's just an expression of his love. But he, he, he knows his death is coming, all of those things, and he's, and he's thinking about that ahead of time, the agony, the, oh, just so much. We can't even fathom what he went through all for us. That's why he came in the first place. So he's basically saying, what am I going to do? Ask that this, this is why I came. 
I can't get out of this. There's, and we want to do that. We want to get out of things that is God's will for us to go through. And sometimes he doesn't deliver us from something. He delivers us through something. And his grace is sufficient for us to go through. Paul the Apostle dealt with this with the, because of the abundance of his revelations. He was given a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed three times that it would be removed. And what did God reveal to him? You know, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in righteousness. You know, Sunday mornings for me sometimes are the hardest day of the week in terms of how I feel, how I, what's going on with me, spiritual warfare. Um, Saturdays can, sometimes can be a lot worse. And I'm not trying to make it about me. I'm just sharing from my heart that Sunday mornings, I have to really, really go deep because of everything that I'm in the middle of and, and what's happening. And I want to be a faithful teacher in all those things. And he's faithful to help. And, and, but you have to be dependent upon him. You have to be yielded to him. It's the death of us. It's the death of us. But what did that life get us before under our own rule? What kind of wisdom were we showing? How, how did our lives look? How were we so great that we could trust our own plans? Isn't that the whole reason why we surrender to him in the first place, in part to follow him? Because God made sure we understood your wisdom looks like this. You're trapped. You're in bondage. You don't have wisdom. It's so funny when people, they sometimes feel like I was raised in a Christian home and no way. God uses the foolish things of this world. And, and so he, he, he takes people like us and he transforms them. But it takes yielding every single day. We can't have a Sunday walk. If you only ate once a week, do you think that your body would be really healthy? But it's weird. We think that somehow spiritually we're going to be healthy if we eat, so to speak, or feed ourselves once a week spiritually. And so people, you know, and none of us have been perfect with our time with him and all those things, but they, 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 they try to do everything and they're religious. Being religious for us is different than what the world reveals. Is they refer to us as being religious. We don't feel like we're religious. We feel like we know Jesus. And we're not going through the motions. That's what we have to guard against. Our habits things that we just go through, we can just get so used to things, we could just have our hearts a million miles away from God. One of the most important times to have devotions is on Sundays. Because we have to become, because this is whole gathering together, this is not supremely for us. It's supremely for others. Giving, serving, loving one another. We're getting better and better at that. We're getting more aggressive with that here. And I love it. Because that's what makes a, that's how Jesus has a place that's alive, and we have to be dependent upon Him. You know, the Church of Sardis. When Jesus wrote to the Church of Sardis, He said, "Remember how you received." Because in the beginning, they're they're receiving from God dependently, at least dependently. But they had gotten out of that whole thing, and they started going through the motions. They started everyone and and everyone from without. And even themselves with self-deception, everyone from without thought this is the place. Calvary Chapel Sardis, man. Woo, have you been there? There's things going on there. There's, every night of the week, there's something going on. It's just, it's, it's alive and all of that. And Jesus comes in and says, that's not my assessment. That's not my assessment at all. You're busy, but you're not dependent upon me anymore. There's no real life there. How do you determine if a church is alive? if they're yielded to God, if they're there as, and their overflow of service is coming from their worship and their, their, their love of, of the Lord. And then it looks like something entirely different than what we would expect. So this is, I've said it before, this is not a gym membership where you come and you just are here for you and then you, you go out and everything's fine and you're, you, know, you come here because it's about ministry. All through the book of 1 Corinthians and these other places, he talks, and Ephesians, he talks about how the body is used in, 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 because discipleship happens not just by the, the leadership. The disciple happens in, also through the other people that are, are here and ministering to each other. And it's, it, that's happening in an increasing way. You do have something to add. You do have something to contribute. You have been given at least one spiritual gift, at least. And God expects you to use that. And it may not be here on Sundays in the sense of whatever gifts you may have that you know, it, there's the body of Christ other places too, and you meet other believers and all those things. But 
When you're here, God calls us to be focused on others. And the degree to which we do that will be the degree to which God uses us, far beyond what we could possibly imagine. But we have to be yielded to him. So he, he says, my soul is troubled. My soul is troubled. He did that for us. Then notice what he does say in verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This is the third time that, that the Father speaks in the Gospels. The first time was at his baptism. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The tenses are that he's already, he, like basically what he was saying is, this is my son in whom I am already well pleased. He hasn't started his public ministry yet. He hadn't become an, a rabbi, you know, you didn't come up, become a rabbi until you were 30. So, so that's when everything would start. And, and, but he says, I am already well pleased. His life before that, for the first 30 years, Jesus pleased the Father. He was already pleased. But then secondly, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he says, this is, it's like, that's a whole, I mean, that's the most potent example of foot and mouth syndrome. You know, uh, where Peter says, oh, he doesn't know what to say, basically. And he goes, oh, it's good that we're here. Let's, we're going to build you tabernacles for, for, for uh, Eli- Moses and Elijah and, and you and all that. And, and the Father speaks. How would you like to put your foot in your mouth? And the Father speaks uh, to, to react to that. And he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Don't put him on the equal, an equal plane with these other men as great as they were. By the way, Moses did make it to the promised land just after he died. Uh, so, but anyway, so he, he says that's a whole nother sermon, but, but, he, but he, he says, hear him, listen to him. He's the one, you know, and then, but this time he speaks here and he says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus said, glorify your name. What does name mean? Name means your character. It means who you are, your essence, all those things. That's why you say, that man has a good name. You're not saying, oh, you know, Barney is such a great name. I mean, he has a great name. The guy's name is Barney. You don't say that. You you know, he has a great name. Like, Barney? Really? Yeah. No, he's not saying that. He's saying that what that guy represents. What he represents, who he is, all of that. And then he's saying glorify that to to the Father. So the response to him being... uh, anxious and, and troubled, his soul's troubled. What did he do? He, he went to the Father. And that's what God calls us to do, to go to him when we're dealing with those things and surrender. And then God speaks to us. He doesn't speak to us audibly. I don't know if you've ever had an audible voice talk to you, but I've never had him speak to me audibly. But he does speak to us through his words, so we need to go to him. So he speaks there and he says, I have glorified it and will glorify it Again, I've already been glorifying my name through my son. It's already being glorified through what, because Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the father. He was already glorifying his name through the son. And he says, and, and I will glorify it again. How? Through, through what Jesus is going to do. Jesus and his ascension, all of that is going to, and also the, you know, the, his, through his, his followers. He was going to glorify his name through his followers, and that includes us. So he says that. Now, he says in, in verse, I mean, in, um, uh, let me get, get back to where I was, verse 29. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it, he, it had thundered, and Jesus, or others said, an angel has spoken to him. So the people that were nearby some of them heard just thunder. Other people said it was an angel that spoke to him. They didn't understand it. The disciples did. John did. John, John heard what, what, what happened, but people that were, were by him didn't. And I don't understand how all of that works, but I know that it worked in that way, very specifically as John revealed it. Verse 30, And Jesus answered and said, the vo- This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. So he's, he's saying, you heard this, but it's for your sake, not for ultimately for me. The, the voice didn't ultimately come for Jesus' benefit, but for your benefit that, that heard this. 
The disciples need to, to hear this for their benefit. The Father spoke it for them. And for us, we get to see it and there's a purpose for it in our lives. But they needed to hear that, 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 that uh, God had already glorified his name through the Lord Jesus and that he's going to uh, glorify it once again. Again, he's preparing them. They were, they were thinking a political Messiah, even on the day he ascended. Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking a political Messiah. They're learning. It's progressive revelation about his true mission. They, they didn't want to hear it. You ever had somebody tell you something over and over again, and you just, you just, you hear it, but you don't, it doesn't hit you. You don't, don't recognize it. You don't listen. You can hear a lot of things and not listen. And so this is going to be uh, increasingly obvious to them as time goes by. But, but again, he says it's for their sakes. Now notice in verse 31, he talks about the judgment of the world. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. See, the, Satan was trying to thwart the plan of God, trying to take him out, but actually it would backfire completely. And the God would use that as the ultimate uh, means by which that we would come to know Christ and, and break the power of Satan's hold on, on people and the deception and all that through this work of the Holy Spirit that he's going to do through the Lord Jesus. So he would, he would accomplish the opposite. Again, he's going to be glorified, which in part means that he's multiplied and had you know, multiplied uh, fruit in, in, in terms of us being the fruit. And, and so he, but he also says this judgment of this world. Now is the judgment of this world. How is that possible? Because the world couldn't save us. The world was against God. The world was against the ways of the ways of this world and the plans of evil men. Don't align with. They didn't think up the gospel. They didn't think up Jesus coming. We didn't think about any of those things. Paul talks about this later when he talks about that this plan was hidden in the, in the before before this time, and now it's been revealed to the, to us. By the Holy Spirit. You know that eye is not seen, not ear is heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. Those that, 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 that what God has planned for us, that's what I'm trying to say. That is not talking about heaven. If you look at the context, he's talking about, because the next verse is, but he has revealed them to us by the Holy Spirit. God gives us the Holy Spirit and he give, allows us to be able to d d discern spiritual things. And the Holy Spirit inside of us has revealed the gospel and for us to understand it and appropriate it. And it's, it's a beautiful, merciful thing, gracious thing that God has done. And then he says, and the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now, ultimately, he will be put into, a, for a thousand years during the millennium, he's going to be incarcerated and, and the angel's going to throw him into the pit. But it's talking about here... It, I mean, it's talking about that too, I'm sure, but it's really getting to what the cross accomplished, the redemptive work of Christ, what that accomplished. We're told in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Talking about the cross, that, that, that Jesus' victory on the cross defeated Satan and, and triumphed over those things, made a public spectacle of them on the cross. It was public. It was a pub, pub, public thing that he did. Uh, every, you know, so many people saw that and witnessed that. So that's what he says. This judge, the judgment of the world, and now this world, and now the rule of this world will be cast out. So he's been disarmed. Then he says in verse 32, and because he's on the topic of the cross, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This is talking about the multiplication. The multiplication that happens. He's going into the, the, the tomb like a seed. He's dying, and then he goes into the tomb, and then he's raised from the dead, and he's glorified, and all of that allows us to have a personal relationship with him. And, and so when, you, when he says, I'd be lifted up, so what they would do is they would have the cross on the ground, they'd dig a hole, and they would nail you to the cross on the ground. They needed the leverage of the ground because there's, what they were doing was incredible. You needed leverage to make it happen. And then they would lift you up on the cross and drop you down into the hole there. And so he's, 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 he's saying, if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. Verse 33, then, then John helps us understand what he was talking about. 
This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So he's dying on the cross. And, and, and David wrote about this in Psalm 22. You can write Psalm 22 in your margin if you want, but if you don't want, you have freedom too. Uh, so, but the, this, this whole, isn't it nice to know the freedom that you have? Uh, you can write things in your margin if you have a margin uh, or put it in your little text in your app or whatever it is. But he said, this is something signifying what death he would die. In Psalm 22, David talks about that. And basically we find out the most amount what, what Jesus went through on the cross, actually from the Old Testament. That was written a thousand years before, roughly, before he was born. And David wrote about Psalm 22. And he, and he talked about the, this whole thing about they will, they will um, pierce my hands and my feet. And that was a thousand, uh, 700, 800 years before they invented crucifixion. It's told how that he would be pierced through his hands and his feet. There's so much that the Bible describes prophetically of his first coming. So amazing, that, but, but that's what would happen. If I be lifted up, I would draw all peoples to myself. Not everyone's going to be saved, of course, but he's working, he's drawing, by his Holy Spirit, he's drawing people through the gospel and directly. can't tell you how many stories I'm hearing of God directly preaching the gospel to people in dreams, and oh, it's just amazing. But the main means is by us sharing the good news. He says, I'll draw all men to myself, all people to myself. And then look at the response of verse 34 of the people. The people answered him, we have heard from the law and the, and the Christ that, um, that the Christ remains forever. How, and how can you say the Son of Man shall be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So this could be these Gentiles that are god fears, or it could be other people. They obviously don't understand, and they're looking at this, these promises of this Messiah sitting on the seat of David forever and, and that they're thinking, how is that possible? How could you be lifted up and die when you're supposed to be our Messiah that rules in this world and, and never dies? Well, they didn't understand that there's other scriptures that talk about that he would be cut off. Some Jewish rabbis thought that there were two Messiahs because they couldn't reconcile those things. This is all before Jesus came, of course. The rabbis, oh no, there's... There's never anything related to that. Can't be talking about what what a Messiah is going to do now because they miss their Messiah. But the the issue is is that he's going to be cut off, and it says in Daniel chapter nine, but not for himself. And he cut off, but not for himself. That's that sacrificial death, dying in our place. They had no idea it was going to come twice. Never thought in a million years that that could be possible. Jesus in Nazareth read from from Isaiah. And he stopped right before. And in between those, when he talks about the, the, the whole thing about, you know, I've come to preach the gospel to the poor and all, the, all that, he's quoting Isaiah. And then the ne very next, he stops though, the next verse is talking about his second coming. They're like roughly 2,000 years in between those two verses in terms of what he, what he was fulfilling. So again, it's, it's, he is progressive revelation for them to understand he came the first time not to be a political messiah. The second time he comes, though, that's going to be, he's going to be everything. He's going to be the political Messiah, the spiritual Messiah, all those things. He's going to come to his own people, comes to Israel, lands on the Mount of Olives. And, and, and he walks, it's an earthquake, the topography changes, he's going to walk down through that eastern gate. They're going to receive him as their Messiah. And, and then he's going to say, I've been here before. And they're going to receive him. So it's, it's beautiful. But in the meantime, we need to preach the gospel, of course, to them. So they, they don't understand uh, the scriptures of Daniel talking about the Messiah being the son of man. They don't understand that. And, and so, uh, you know, Daniel specifically talks about this. Um, and you can write, again, write that in your margin. Verse 35. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So you have me while you do and take advantage of that. Become sons of light by trusting in me, by following me. And then you won't be spiritually fumbling around 
I mean, it affects our physical lives, but before we come to know the Lord, we're clueless spiritually. I love all these experts that have never read the Bible, but they know all about the Bible. You know, have you read, have you read the Bible? Yeah, I've read the Bible. Genesis to Revel. Oh, no, no. And I go, I know you haven't, most likely, because most Christians haven't read from Genesis to Revelation before. It's, it's a lot there. And it's written, you know, for, for us, it's not supremely written for them. And, and, you know, it shows that if they get into the law and they try to get into all that, if they're not Jewish or any, it's just a, it's, they don't understand it. And so, uh, you know, he's, he's saying, this is happening. This is happening. I am going to the cross. I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to be uh, used by the Father to, to help people come to know me. And, and, and that's what you need. That there's spiritual darkness. Before we come to know him and our eyes are opened, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you haven't followed Jesus yet, you haven't received uh, salvation as a gift, once that happens, your spiritual eyes are opened. You see things that you never thought you would see. And I don't mean like seeing demons float around or anything like that. I'm talking about the battle, the battle that's going on in this world for souls. You see what's behind everything. You see God work in people. You see how it's just, there's so much that you, that you can see so clearly. And, 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 then God, and God wants that for you. He wants you to live on, on, the, on a supernatural plane. As, as a believer. And, and, and he says we have to be sons of light and we're transformed. And so he calls us, we calls us those things and he tells us to walk in, in light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. There has to be that honesty and that spiritual purity in the sense of being yielded to him or else we can't have fellowship with each other. We can't have that supernatural building up of one another. It's not just talking about current events or having taught, we think it, that's a whole nother thing. But koinonia is a spiritual dynamic where we're spiritually built up. When we talk about the themes and the script, the themes of the Lord and the scriptures, we, and we're building each other up. It's not just talking about the, not the 49ers as much as I like that. It's spiritual. It's not, you know, the world can have community, but they can't have koinonia. I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of that word community, but there's no real equivalent. But it's, koinonia is something that only Christians can have. And it's a beautiful thing. We get built up. That's why it says in Acts chapter 2 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and prayer fellowship. Fellowship is one of them. And, and that's, that's what we're trying to grow in those things. That's why we need to take advantage of the things that God has offered to us for fellowship and to depart or impart things to other believers and encourage them. And that's happening increasingly in our church. And it's a huge, huge, huge blessing. So notice at the end of verse 36, though, that Jesus was hidden from them. It doesn't say Jesus hid from them. It's passive in the original language. He was someone, some, you know, someone other than himself hid him, and they couldn't find him. And there's a, there's, he, basically, this is pretty much, I mean, John's going to comment, you know, review things that he says and everything and all that before we get to, to chapter 13, and we'll get into that next week, but... The thing is, his main public ministry in the sense of being exposure, being exposed to crowds and all those things is pretty much done at this point. So now he's going to switch his attention to these last few days. He's going to focus his attention on the disciples and preparing them for his departure. Then after he raises from the dead, he's going to appear to them multiple times and he's kind of weaning them off of himself, getting, as he's already promised the Holy Spirit, the, the helper, that, that's just like him. It's exactly like him. That's why he says another helper. And that word another means another of the same kind. So he's, he's going to promise that, weed them, weed, wean them off of himself before his ascension. And then he's going to say, okay, now wait here, and I'll give you the power that I promised so that you could be witnesses to me. What a privilege it is to uh, be a, a disciple of his. And we know where we're going. We're confident. In, in what he said, and we believe that. And so this whole thing about glorification, part of glorification is multiplication for us and for obviously for him and what he did and accomplished and how it's affected the whole world. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your scriptures. We thank you for who you are. We yield to you. Jesus, we want to be 
your disciples in every way possible. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would help us to grow and, and, that, and we thank you that you see when we say no to things that aren't pleasing to you and it blesses you, regardless if anyone ever knows about it or sees it. You see it and it pleases you. Help us to grow in our, our relationship with you through this as we die and help us to multiply and bear fruit by your grace and by your power. In Jesus' name, amen.